So, you want to be a rocketeer. You're in good company. Humans have been building and flying rockets for centuries, ever since gunpowder was invented in China. To this day, aerospace engineers and scientists work tirelessly to send satellites, robots, and people further and further into space. And with model rocketry, you can follow in their trajectories. If you're new to the hobby, this video can help you understand some of the choices that you will have to make as you design a rocket. It will also demonstrate a few techniques that you can use to make sturdy rockets. Aerospace engineers launch rockets to carry something like a satellite, a robot, or an astronaut, what we call a payload, into space. We also usually have a specific orbit or landing site in mind for a destination. A payload is delicate and needs to be protected during launch and landing. Instead of a multi-billion dollar space probe, let's launch a grade A large hen's egg and no hard boiling it. If you're feeling adventurous, launch two, break them, and it's mission failure. To get the payload where we want it to go, a rocket must fly with a precisely controlled speed and direction. Instead of shooting for the moon, let's target a maximum altitude of exactly 825 feet and aim for a total launch to landing flight duration of 48 to 50 seconds. We'll start with zero points. For each foot we miss the altitude target by, we'll take a point. For each second we miss the duration target by, we'll take four points. The fewer points, the better. These mission parameters are based on the 2014 rules of the Team America Rocketry Challenge, a model rocketry contest for middle and high school students in the U.S. It's not just a model rocket contest, it's an introduction to aerospace engineering with a much lower cost and risk than real spaceflight. There is also the $73,000 in prizes to consider. Even if you aren't eligible to compete officially, it's still a great self-imposed challenge to test your ability as a model rocketeer and amateur aerospace engineer. All right, space cadets, that's enough introduction. It's time to learn how to design and build an egg lofter. Most large model rockets, including egg lofters, look something like this diagram. In aerospace engineering, it pays to be methodical in our work. When I build rockets and prepare them for launch, I like to work from bottom to top so I don't forget anything in the middle. So that's how this video will be organized. A rocket big enough to carry an egg will most likely have a diameter much larger than that of the motor. If so, it will need a motor mount to act as the adapter. Model rocket motors come in a wide range of sizes. As a starting point, I recommend using an E or F motor for TARC rockets. The motor mount is probably the most important part of the rocket. A rocket can fly with bad fins or a bad nose cone, but it absolutely must hold its motor securely in order to fly safely. Here's a typical motor mount for holding a high thrust engine, like an Aerotech E30. The key parts are a tube that matches the diameter and length of the motor, and centering rings that fit the motor tube on the inside and the body tube on the outside. Notice how thin the centering rings are. They have to bear the entire thrust of the rocket motor. To make the mount stronger, we cut and glue in these pieces of balsa that fit between the centering rings and the motor tube. To make the mount stronger still, we apply beads of glue, called fillets, to each of the corners. Optional components are an engine block glued in the top end of the motor tube and a hook running down the side. The engine block stops the motor from sliding forward when it ignites. However, some motors come with a flange at the back end to do the same thing. The hook keeps the motor from popping out of the back of the tube when its ejection charge fires. I've never seen a motor mount fail at any of these joints. The motor mount failures I've seen all happened at the joint between the centering rings and the body tube because the builder didn't glue the motor mount incorrectly. This usually results in a landing euphemistically called a ballistic recovery. We put glue around the inside rim of the body tube and push the first ring of the motor mount in. Then we put glue around the rim again before pushing in the second centering ring. Just push it in about a half inch deep, fill at the corner between the body tube and rear centering ring, and let it set. The next most critical part of a rocket is its fins. A rocket uses fins to be stable, and if we don't build and attach them properly, the rocket won't fly as straight or high as it could. G. Harry Stein's Handbook of Model Rocketry has a nice illustration of various fin shapes we can use. I prefer the shape known as the clipped delta. It is simple to cut and doesn't have any sharp, easily damaged corners. In general, larger fins make the rocket more stable, but they are more vulnerable to damage, and they can increase drag on the rocket, decreasing its maximum altitude. Some teams intend intentionally attach more fins or make them larger to decrease their rocket's maximum altitude if they find it's flying too high. If we make our fins out of a grained material, like balsa or basswood, we should make the grain align with the leading edge of the fin. Notice how flexible balsa is in the cross-grain direction. If we run the grain parallel to the root of the fin, 
it's much easier to damage the fins in the middle when they land. Whatever dimensions and shape we choose for our fins, they should be identical. Once we've cut out our fins, we can hold them all together and sand them all down to be the same. I like to sand the leading and trailing edges of my fins to give them a more aerodynamic shape. The tip of the fin should either be left square or sanded sharp. The root should not be sanded at all, so that it stays rough and has plenty of surface area for the glue to adhere to. When gluing fins to the body tube, I use the double gluing technique. I apply a line of glue to the fin, press it to the body, pull it off, smooth off the excess glue, and wait for 30 seconds before pressing it back down. We can use a jig to hold the fins on straight as the glue dries. After gluing the fins on, we apply little fillets of glue to the corners to reduce their drag. This glue doesn't serve a structural purpose, but an aerodynamic one. Since we only need to make it so the corner isn't sharp, we can wipe a finger along the fillet to remove any excess glue. I have seldom seen a properly constructed and attached fin break in the wood or at the glue joint. It has almost always been the cardboard of the body tube that fails first. The body of the rocket is the primary structural component. We can lay out our internal components beside a stock body tube to figure out how long it needs to be before we actually cut cardboard. Making the body longer increases the stability of the rocket, but it also increases mass and drag. That said, if we make our rocket's body longer than it absolutely has to be, we can cut it down very easily to reduce mass and surface area. Extending a body tube that is too short is much more challenging, and leaves more seams, which substantially increases drag. One technique to reduce the mass and surface area of the body tube is to use a transition. Carrying an egg requires a fairly wide body tube diameter, but behind the payload section, we can neck down to a smaller diameter diameter for the booster section. Bear in mind that using a transition will make the rocket longer by several inches because we can't store anything inside them. Rocket simulation software can help us figure out which trade-off is the best for any particular design. We can use putty to fill in the spiral groove of a cardboard body tube to reduce drag further. If the groove is small, we can instead fill it during painting. When painting the completed rocket, we should use one or two coats of white primer paint and sand the rocket in between coats. This will cause little gaps to be filled and little bumps to be sanded down, making the rocket smoother overall. A bright coat of paint will help us spot our rocket from a distance. I like fluorescent orange as it stands out against the sky, clouds, trees, and dirt. It's generally best to start with a parachute that is bigger than we think is necessary, so that the rocket is at least guaranteed to land safely on its maiden flight. We can switch to a smaller parachute or cut a hole in the middle if we need it to fall faster. The parachute must be protected from the hot gases of the ejection charge. For TARC in particular, it is also vitally important to control every aspect of launch, so rather than the usual disposable recovery wadding, we can thread a Nomex sheet onto the recovery system so that we are guaranteed to have the same mass every time. Another major choice for the recovery system is whether the rocket falls as one piece or as separate pieces. Sometimes, competition rules require us to go with one or the other. In 2014, the rocket had to fall together. But if the choice is available, consider the following. If our rocket falls separately, we have to find two pieces. Since we will be watching the payload section for timing purposes, we'll know where that lands, but we'll need to deputize someone to watch the booster section. We can also more precisely control the descent of the payload section, since it will be simpler on its own. If the whole rocket falls as one item, with both pieces attached to each other with a shot cord, the rocket will fall faster for a given size of parachute, and the rocket is more likely to get tangled or damaged as the pieces swing and bump into each other. We can control this to some extent with proper packing technique, and also by using snap swivels or barrel swivels from a fishing supply store to leave the parachutes free to spin without tangling. The payload for this mission is an egg or two eggs and an altimeter. Most small altimeters work by reading air pressure, so the rocket needs to have holes to allow the altimeter to make its readings. Altimeter's user manuals usually have specific instructions on hole size and placement, but in general, the holes should be kept away from transitions, edges, and attachments so that the altimeter gets a reading of the true air pressure as opposed to sensing turbulence. To protect the payloads, the most important factor is to prevent them from rattling around and coming into contact with anything hard a plastic nose cone, the ground, the body tube, or each other for the most part. We can buy foam with little egg depressions cut out already, or cut our own foam, but I found egg carton cups work just fine as egg padding. We need to be sure we can easily withdraw our payload without forcing anything. Cracking the egg when extracting it from the rocket is a terrible feeling. We can help this by sanding the edges of the altimeter mount centering rings so that it can slip easily into the rocket. 
So, you should now have a basic understanding of some of the choices you will have to make in designing a larger egg lofting rocket, and understand a few techniques you can use to make sturdy rockets. If you're looking for more information, you can consult the Handbook of Model Rocketry or local rocket clubs in your area. I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial video. Good luck, Space Cadet!